pretty quick and to the point. So this is essentially the abstract of a publication and a couple of my co-authors are here, Georgia and Moira, and we also co-authored with some clinicians, some radiation oncologists working in the head and neck cancer space. So the objective was an exploration of people's experiences. I also want to throw out the patient word, but you know, it sometimes happens <laughs> and it's happened here. Their experiences of communication with health professionals following a diagnosis of head and neck cancer. It was qualitative research uh, based on social constructionist theory. So it's really the science of stories. These 21 stories of people's experiences focused around communication, threw up some very interesting themes we identified out of the stories they told. Essentially, the loss of ability to speak can be both a physical side effect of treatments in head and neck cancer and can also be a holistic experience of silencing. People found the loss of their ability to communicate clearly to be very distressing and traumatic, but it wasn't just the loss of voice. It was also to do with some different kind of tensions within the relationships that they felt with the health professionals that they had become you know, very dependent on and were seeing a lot of. The communication style, a lot of people reported that they found it very fast, very abrupt, but they also recognised the contrast that was there when they did have communications with people that were a bit more slow paced. Not that they necessarily were moving slowly and working slowly, but their communication style was a bit more paced and mindful. Here's a quote from one of the participants who said they felt like it's a production line. They don't have time for any conversation or the conversation is all about the treatment. So there's that depersonalisation, dehumanising kind of experience again. There were also issues in communication to do with health literacy. There are a couple of different kind of cohorts with head and neck cancer and some of them have lower health literacy levels which meant that if they were exposed to a lot of medical terminology and jargon, they were missing a big part of their own health picture. This person actually probably would score quite highly on health literacy, but nonetheless, they said, I remember that the health professionals were all frantic. They were talking in medical language, talking to each other in medical language, so they felt like an outsider in the communication about their very important health treatment decision that they needed to make. And then systemically, the model of care seems to be problematic for people. They feel this sense of a hierarchy and they feel that it's kind of old school. It hasn't kept pace with what we're talking about here, this person-centred, trauma-informed, compassionate approach. It's not coming from that biopsychosocial model that is held up as the ideal. So this person, in fact, the, the, there were a couple describing how just dozens of people seem to flood into the room to poke and prod them, to talk maybe about something treatment related and then they'd leave again and that it felt so quick and confusing and they didn't know what was happening whatsoever. So this is the conclusion from this exploration around communication experiences of people with health, head and neck cancer, that when people are diagnosed with head and neck cancer, they may lose their literal voice temporarily, they might have periods of being voiceless, but they might be able to speak and yet still feel unheard in their treatment situation. It can be too often disempowering and a silencing of their experiences. Thank you.